Hey, welcome to church. Uh, if you are new here, my name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor here. I uh, want to welcome you online as well. Um, but if you are new, uh, we'd love to meet you and greet you because here's the thing. We truly do believe that this is a church, but this church is a community of believers. That's what this point is, that we walk our faith out together in community. It doesn't just happen on a Sunday, but every day of our lives. And speaking of that today, so we've been going through the book of Acts just verse by verse. And the book of Acts is famous for being the beginning of the church. Um, but what we see, especially in this text, is a conversation about really what is the point what is the point of church? What's the point of our faith? What is, what's the point? Like for many of us, maybe today you're here and you're kind of just like, what is this thing about? What really is this about? Is it some organization, some, some brick building where you come to every week? Like what is the point? And the same question might come about our faith. What's, what's the point of, of being a Christian? Like, what is the actual, like, how do we know if we're doing it? Like, how do you, how do you know that you're a Christian? Cause you, you say you are, like, cause that's what most of our society does. They're just like, I'm a Christian. It's like, cool. I, I guess, like, I don't know. How do we know? What do, how do we know this? So today we're going to dive into this text. And just so you see kind of where we're at. Uh, Stephen is a guy that's been speaking for some verses now. Stephen is preaching, and he's preaching to a group of religious leaders. Now, whenever we say that when we're reading the Bible, it's never a good thing. Religious leaders are a problem. I think that could be somewhat true today, too. And uh, Stephen is speaking, he's preaching to them, and he's been sharing just like truth after truth after truth. And then he gets to the end of his message, which is what we'll read today. And he really kind of just recaps it all. And he, he deals with this issue, this question, like, what's the point? And they've been arguing over something. See, Stephen is explaining something about Jesus who has come, who has went to the cross, who is resurrected, who has conquered sin and death once and for all. And now Stephen's proclaiming this, like, guys, don't miss it because the religious leaders have missed it so far. And he's trying to get them to recognize it. And their focus is fully on the temple, the church, the building, like what happens there in that place. And Stephen's been speaking about this trying to get them to recognize it. So today, let's just dive in. Acts chapter 7, and we're going to pick up at verse 44, I believe. Acts 7, verse 44. Let me read that. It says this, Our ancestors carried the tabernacle with them through the wilderness. It was constructed according to the plan God had shown Moses... Years later, when Joshua led our ancestors in battle against the nations that God drove out of this land, the tabernacle was taken with them into their new territory. And it stayed there until the time of King David. David found favor with God and asked for the privilege of building a permanent temple for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who actually built it. So Stephen is speaking to these religious leaders. They're interrogating him. Make sure you understand what's going on. They're not having a fun conversation over a cup of coffee and it's like back and forth. No, it's an interrogation and it is heated. And it's Stephen, one guy, against the religious leaders and a crew of them. And he's now at this point, he's shared history, he's sharing facts, and now he gets to this point, he's like, hey, your focus on the temple, remember how this started. And he goes, hey, remember, it started with the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle for us, so we understand, it would be something God uh, told Moses to build, and he, he showed them how to do it. He gave them exact dimensions and everything about it, and the temple would be, for us, the best way I could explain it, it would be like a very large, like, tent-like structure that they could take down and they could travel with and then they could set back up and they would do this remember they traveled for 40 years and every like month or so they were staying in one area and then they picked everything up they took it with them and they set it all back up this would happen over and over again this is what they're used to they understand this they know this so they would in that temple in that tabernacle would be the ark of the covenant it'd be like a treasure chest if you will with some really important like memorable stuff about what god has done but it would also be the representation of the presence of god there with them so they would set up this tabernacle, this large structure. In it would be the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. 
There they would worship. They would have their sacrifices, everything. This is what they knew. The religious leaders, this is how they lived every day of their life. Stephen's reminding them, hey, you remember all this stuff. You know all this history. And what they're angry about is that he is like, if you will, explaining that the temple doesn't have the type of importance, if you will, that they think it does. Now, it still is important. It still plays a role. But he's saying, hey, guys, you're missing it. You're missing Christ, the Messiah, who all of this pointed to. Paul later will explain, he will say, you are the temple. Your body is. Your body is the tabernacle, the temple. And and in you is the presence of God. And this is what Stephen's pointing to. He's saying, because of the Messiah, whom you have missed out on, who you overlooked, like because of Jesus, now you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Okay, now overview. Stephen just like name drops one after another. For them, they know every name and the importance of every name. So when he says, hey, Abraham, you remember Abraham, a father of the faith. Abraham, the one whom like God used to bring about a new covenant, if you will, between God and man and humanity, like this relationship, this is how we would have a relationship with God. And Abraham would bring that about. But then quickly what we see is that the people of Israel, just like you and I today, they twist it and manipulate it. And the relationship with God that they were instructed to have, they twisted it and they ruined it, right? The same for us. We, we have the word of God before us, but so often what do we do? We manipulate it so it fits our agenda, so it fits what we want, so it's how we like, like whatever it can be, our culture, our culture says this or that. So now our word of God, we twist it however we can make it fit, but also very religious people will twist it so it fits their own traditions and comforts and whatever it might be. And he's going, hey, you remember the father of the faith, but they messed it up. And you remember the story of Joseph and Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers and, and he's put into Egypt and he's in prison and he's a slave and all these problems, problem after problem after problem. But you remember after decade after decade, Joseph raised up to the second in command and that God used Joseph to bring about hope and provision for the people of Israel who faced famine later on. And what Joseph says is he says, hey, what you meant for evil God has done for good. And then he explains like, hey, but you also know of Moses. And Moses was the one that when Israel was in Egypt, they became slaves of Egypt. But Moses was used by God to free them out of slavery and to discover the promised land. And in that then, he's reminding them again, like, remember that this happened and God provided freedom when you were once a slave. And then he says, and King David, and everyone loves King David, and David's awesome. And David would bring about hope again, and he would bring about like this this conviction and the strength for the nation of Israel. And everyone's like, yes, that's what it's about. And Solomon built the temple, right? He's sharing this history, but what he's pointing to and what he will continue to point to throughout his sermon is this. Remember Abraham, father of our faith, the one that brought about a covenant between man and God, right? Well, there is a new covenant because it is established through the name and the blood of Jesus Christ. So make sure you understand it. Abraham was pointing a symbol of the coming Messiah. Oh, and you know the story of Joseph and how they were sold into slavery and, and, and that this problem after problem, but what man used for evil, God used for good. Hey, here's a truth about what happened. When you were sold into slavery and you let your sin consume you and ruin you and take you away from the grace and the work of Jesus. Here's the thing. Jesus was the one that what you meant for evil, God has done for good. And on the cross, he has, res- he has brought you back in. And you know the story of, of Moses and, and how he freed them from slavery and bondage. Well, Jesus Christ has freed you from slavery of sin and ruin of this world. The whole thing, what Stephen's doing is he's going, hey, guys, guys, don't miss this. Every single prophet that we look up to is a symbol pointing to the coming Messiah. And he's going, and he has come and he is already accomplished it. And when you put your faith in him, you are brought in and you, everything is solidified. Here's the thing for you today. We can be so preoccupied with like, what does it mean to be a Christian? And, and what, like, what does a good life look like? And, and we can be so focused on like, I, I need to know a little more. I need to do a little more and all that. But I can tell you, honestly, if you are here today, wherever you stand in your faith, the biggest question and the only thing that matters is who do you say Jesus is? 
That is essential. Like, so many people will go to church and you'll look for motivational things. Like, right? like, that church made me feel good. And it's like, that's really nice. But at the end of the day, that means nothing. And it has no value that will sustain you because if you do not recognize who Jesus is, everything else is worthless. This is the point. This is what Stephen is like hammering on. And he's reminding them time after time, and he's pointing out different prophets that they love and look up to, and they speak with authority. But he's going, no, guys, you're missing it. All of them pointed to the coming Messiah, and he has come, and everything has been fulfilled in the name of Jesus. The whole time, this is what he's pointing to. This is what he's revealing to them. And he's done it over and over again. And today, I think the biggest question is just, who do you say Jesus is? This is the most important question. And if you haven't answered that question, no other question in your life matters. I promise you. Like, you can be like, no, I got to solve the question or the issue in my marriage or in my work or my finances or whatever it might be. I promise you none of those matter if this one doesn't matter. All those are answered through who Jesus is. And that might sound cheesy to you. And you might be like, that doesn't solve my marriage. No, it really does. Okay, so he said this, right? But he continues. And now he, he, he goes into it. He goes, however, the Most High doesn't live in a temple made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Could you build me a temple as, as that? Ask the Lord. Could you build me such a resting place? Didn't my hands make both heaven and earth? So remember, their biggest like beef is over the temple. How could Stephen say that that is not what's essential? Doesn't, doesn't Stephen know that everything that happens in the temple is the most important thing? Doesn't, doesn't Stephen get, like, Stephen is so far off base here. And Stephen's response is, dude, don't you remember what the Old Testament, what, what the scripture said? Like, the temple is pathetic in the presence of, like, who really God is. It's man-made at the end of the day. And that's been their whole focus for decades now is like, what happens in the temple? The rules, the rituals, everything that happens here, how you dress, what you do. Like, doesn't that kind of at some point sound familiar for us today? So many people, like it's, it's the tradition of a Sunday when you go to church, like how that looks, what's supposed to happen there, like how that goes. Like, it's also the, like, it's somewhat humorous, but sometimes people will go to church, right? You're talking with them, you're having coffee or whatever. And, and all of a sudden they're like, yeah, man. And that mother, I mean, oh, I'm a church, like my bad. And it's like, at the end of the day, like that's maybe a, a, a small, funny version of a problem that all of us have. You think what mattered is that you were about to cuss at church. But remember, like, this is a building, guys. Like, there is something important about the church and the gathering of believers, but it's not the building that's important. So don't you know that that because of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, it's the same when you're at work. And it's the same when you're in your home. So the way you talk at church, it should represent how you talk at home or what you're being is a hypocrite. And that's the problem that many people have with church, right, is we're hypocrites, is you act one way, but then you're a whole another way somewhere else. And we, we totally have like lost the plot. And we, we think this is what a good Christian looks like, what you do on Sunday and then nah, whatever you want. Like, right? Like that's how it looks. And it's like, man, you're missing it. And for many of us, maybe today you're still going, what is the point of this? And the problem is you're looking for like, what is my Sunday supposed to look like maybe? Or what is this? But it's like, no, when you recognize that it's the presence of God and it's the community of believers and that happens every day, every minute of your life. And Stephen's going, guys, you're missing it. And you're focusing on rules and rituals. And Jesus, the the flesh of God has come to this earth and he preached to you too and you've missed it. And you're still missing it. And Stephen now is getting to a point where he's trying to get them to get this and recognize this and see this. And so your focus is off, right? You're, you're missing what really matters for things that don't actually matter. And then he says this, I love this. So this whole time, Stephen has been preaching 
And he's had one of the longer sermons, actually, in the Bible. Um, So he had a lot of time to share. And he shared some really important things. And he started, like, there were moments that you heard earlier weeks where he's preaching to these men, these religious leaders. He says, hey, brothers and fathers, this would be a sign of respect, right? Like, he's recognizing their, their importance, their value. Hey, we're family here, like, all this kind of stuff. He's speaking to them with, like, endearment. And he's, he's trying to get them to see it, and then they don't, and they push back. And he tries again, and he, he now shares history. He's like, dude, remember from the very beginning to now, like, Jesus has always been the point. Like, all this stuff, and he's trying to get them to get it, and they don't. And then he goes, and he says this. He says, you stubborn people, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Now, for us, maybe that's not the most hurtful thing you've ever heard in your life, but just replace that with something a little, you idiots, you fools, you loser, how dumb are you? Like, some of you are like, dude, that's kind of mean. Like, that, at some point, he's getting to a place because the whole time he's been trying. And the same is true, like, if you continue to look at the Gospels and see Jesus and his ministries, the continuously trying, that even the, those that are speaking so ill against the Gospel and so ill against Jesus, Jesus continues to try to reveal himself that they would finally be humbled and see it. And Stephen's doing the same thing. It's like, hey, man, man, if you got the brothers, like, dude, if you, you guys see this, what Jesus has done, and they don't. And it's like, you guys look at history, like, look at science, look at everything that reveals that there's a creator, and, and they don't get it. So he's like, man, you idiots, like, look, like, you got to see this. This matters. This is important. This is essential. And the same is true for us is like, again, nothing else matters unless this matters. And he's trying to get their attention, however he can at this point. He says, must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors did, didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. And you're still missing it, guys. He's like, dude, don't. I've, I've tried every way I can. And you can continue your religion, but if it's not founded in the grace and the gospel of Jesus, it means nothing. And he tries and he tries, and they still don't get it. And this same struggle is for us, is, is we can be so busy with the things of the church that you miss the thing that matters the most. And he's trying and he's trying. And my question for us is like, what really matters? And are the things that maybe you thought matter just like distractions from the real thing that matters? And for us as Christians, we say this here as we say that everyone has one is what, what I mean is this, like no matter who you are today, no matter how much of the Bible you know, no matter how long you follow Jesus for, whether one day or a hundred days, if we have anyone in here that's that all, like no matter who you are, like I believe God has placed someone in your life that he's gonna use you to reach. And maybe it's gonna be from a simple like, hey, let's hang out, let's grab some coffee, let's cook out, let's get some tacos, like whatever it might be. Maybe it's someone that you know deeper than that, and you can have those real authentic conversations with, and you're like, you idiot, dude, you're missing it. Like, hey, you're, you're, you're coming over and you're complaining about your marriage. I can tell you why your marriage is falling apart, because you're focusing on yourself. Like, maybe you need to humble yourself and let Christ lead your family. Like, maybe that'll solve it. Hey, you're struggling in your workplace and you're mad because everyone else is complaining and arguing and all this stuff. And they're always talking really bad things and you join in on it because that's what you do. And like, all this stuff. Maybe it's because you're focused on what work you're doing and what paycheck you're getting, but you're not focused on that. Maybe that job is also an opportunity that God has placed you in. Like, maybe, maybe you're wrong. Maybe you need to have that conversation with that friend or that family member. But here's the thing. All of us should be like Stephen in this where, man, wherever you're at in that moment, I believe there's one person that God might use you. Even when you don't feel like you're qualified or capable, that's usually when he uses you. And maybe you need to be a little more like St- Stephen in this moment where maybe you've like been like, hey, want to come to church? And they're like, no, nah, I'm good. 
but maybe they're that friend that you could have a little more of a deeper conversation with. And maybe you need to call them a stubborn heathen heart or something like that. But here's what I mean. Maybe, maybe we as Christians have just sat back and kind of been like, well, if someone wants to know about Jesus, they'll come to me. They know I go to church. But maybe he wants you to step forward. And maybe he wants you to actually step into what I believe he has already qualified you and called you to. Okay. Here's the thing. You can hear this message and you can choose to kind of listen to it and be like, cool, not that motivational today, maybe next time. Like, you can hear and then go about your life. That's how you sound in my head every time. You are Kermit the Frog. I don't know why Kermit the Frog is the voice I go with, but it is, and you'll get used to it. You could, you could just respond that way and just be like, nah, go about my life. Or maybe you could go, you know what? What about like church and my faith? What about it? Am I actually like focusing on the wrong things? So I'm, I'm, I'm going through the motions, but I'm missing the meat. What, what areas have I just become like st- stagnant in? And the, the question will, it'll be a heart check. It'll be a, maybe, maybe it's traditions, maybe it's those things, but it'll also be a moment where we recognize something that Stephen, I think, was pointing to. And it's interesting, next week you're going to hear this more. We have one more moment of Stephen's like ministry and journey next week that we're going to unpack. Stephen is going to, um, he's done talking. We just finished Stephen's talking. And now the religious leaders are going to do what they do. And here's the thing. The religious leaders have heard everything, but they still don't listen. For some of you today, that's the same for you. They're going to act against God. Stephen is going to experience a very difficult moment in his life. And to ruin the story, his last moment of this earth life. Because of what he said and the truth that he was proclaiming. And while they're going against him, there's going to be this moment that he has that I just want you to hold for a week and then we unpack next week. He's going to have a moment where he's being murdered and he will look up and he will see the presence of God. And I just look at that and I go... He just was talking about all these different things. Remember what the tabernacle was for. Remember what we did, like why it existed. Remember why the temple exists. It's a reminder of the presence of God. And wherever they went, the presence of God went with them. And now remember this, through the action of the like of what Jesus has done and the Holy Spirit dwelling in each believer. Now it is the presence of God that dwells in me and dwells in you. It is the presence of God. That is what you should be searching for and longing for and following every day and every moment of your life. And it's in that moment where he has been obedient and he has stood against some of the most difficult times in his faith, in his life, where he sees the presence of God before him when everyone else is attacking him. It's this reminder and this assurance. But in the same way, I say this to you. It is the presence of God that you should only be longing for. What is the point of this? What is the point of this? What is the point of community? What is the point of this church? What is the point? It is the presence of God. That he dwells in us, that he guides us, that he leads us, that we follow that. For some of you today, You've, you've had a hard week, a hard month. You've experienced grief and loss and hurt. And the thing you need is the presence of God. For some of you, you've been just going through the motions and life has been okay. And the bills have been paid and you're doing it, right? You're just, you're doing it. Whatever that means, you're doing it. Like you're living the American dream. Like whatever. what you need is the presence of God. You're walking through the ups and downs of relationships, of marriage, of parenting, of all these different things. What you need is the presence of God. 
Stephen points to it and he says, man, everything was pointing to the presence of God. That's the thing that matters. That's what's with us. That's what we follow. That is what leads us and guides us. That's the strength that we have. That's everything. That's what matters. And every moment of that, and Stephen is reminded of that again and again as he proclaims this to them. What you need to be reminded of is that the presence of God is all that matters. How do you receive? How do you get the presence of God? I believe you ask for it. I believe, I believe he continues to reveal his presence to us in his word. I believe that every question, every, every decision you're making, every action that you take is to desire the presence of God to guide and lead you. But that's the most important thing you could get and receive today, I believe. Can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, I pray for each of us today. God, I pray for some of us where our, our faith is weak. And we're, we're just kind of getting by. God, I just pray that your presence would just overwhelm us today. Give us strength and conviction. For some of us, we have these moments where we're yearning for or desire, like, man, I feel like I should say that thing to my friend. God, I just pray for your presence to give us that strength. For some of us, we're walking through the hardest times right now, God. And it's heavy and it's hard but the only way that burden is lifted is your presence. God, for each of us here today, we just respond, God, would your presence come? We receive your presence. We submit to your presence. That you would guide us and lead us. God, that we don't get focused on traditions, we focus on your presence. God, that everything you do and everything you have done and everything you say points to the greatest of news of all. That you would love us so much that you would come to this earth, that you would carry our sin and our transgressions to the cross, that you'd be the sacrifice that we could never be on our own, and that through that action you have paid a debt, and now we are brought back into relationship with you. We receive your presence. It's the name of Jesus, the name above all other names that we say. Amen.